It's the late 90s, early 2000s. You just got off the school bus and are walking home in your hoodie while kicking leaves off the side of the road. You make it into your house, sit down at the kitchen table, and begin rummaging through your backpack for your homework as the TV plays in the background. Movies with monsters, angsty teenagers on bikes, slashers, demons possessing people, and things. The whole wide gamut that horror has to offer. Growing up in the dark ages before having 20 different streaming services at your fingertips, or even DVRs for that matter, you typically just watched whatever was on TV. Maybe you had a few channels that you would switch back and forth from, and maybe you went to the nearest blockbuster once a month and rented a couple movies. But that's truly the extent of it. Around October, however, all of these movie channels would become gold mines for budgeting horror fans when they switched their normal content to non-stop horror for Halloween. Back-to-back -back films that get you in the spooky mood. Hocus Pocus, Pumpkinhead, and so many more. Later at night, when you're supposed to be asleep but you have the TV on with the sound down, they would move to franchises, playing from the first entry to the last. Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, Child's Play, Hellraiser, Alien, Predator, Evil Dead, Phantasm, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. If I have any more fun today, I don't think I'm gonna be able to take it. Newer ones like I Know What You Did Last Summer and Scream, older ones like the Universal Horror Creatures or Hammer Horror, and we can't forget one of my personal favorites, Puppet Master. These were referred to as marathons and sometimes Halloweenathons. It's something of a tradition that I hope a lot of people have kept alive as we've slowly moved away from scheduled television. Back to that selection though. Hey, I'm Hound, by the way. Notice how there's really just a bunch of slashers there? When you look at lists of movies to binge for Halloween, and you had to guess what franchise gets featured every single time, what would you put your kittens on? Got my good luck charm with me. <sighs> yeah, Halloween, obviously. If, if you're wondering what to put on for Halloween, Halloween, it's in the fucking name. But I seriously disagree with this notion and believe that there has long been a series deserving of the throne that Halloween has been hogging for far too long. Friday the 13th, out of all the slasher series, and I'd even argue out of all the big horror franchises, is the most consistent and constantly delivering of them. But I don't want to just tell you. I want to explain and hopefully show you the enlightened way. So let's put these giants head to head. But first, the criteria. What do you want from a Halloween binge? Obviously a big one will be if it brings the autumnal vibes. There's just something special about watching a film and being able to look outside and it just looks and feels the exact same way. It's very important to me. Consistency will be key. It doesn't necessarily have to be scary, but the atmosphere has to be right. It has to be the right level of horror mixed with fun, but most importantly, that tone has to be consistent between each installment. If one part is super serious, <laughs> and another part is practically slapstick with a straight to DVD B-movie plot, I'll get you, my pretty, and your little soul, too. <laughs> they don't really blend that well when you watch them in rapid succession. Finally is the longevity of the franchise. How many entries and how many of those are, like we said, consistent in tone and story and can be viewed in succession without sticking out like a sore thumb or being too off to watch. We're going to be going over these two franchises as if we were watching them from first to last entry. No skipping allowed and see how they fare. Starting with Halloween. So, does Halloween bring the autumn vibes? Yeah, of course, 
Halloween is going to be the winner for autumn vibes. You can't go two shots without seeing a pumpkin or leaves or someone in a costume. This one definitely passes with flying colors. On to the individual films and their consistency. Halloween 1. This is the one that started it all. The popularity of this film is what ended up giving us more and more slashers. Laurie Strode is a babysitter on Halloween, doing things like a responsible adult while all of her friends prefer to do things like sex and alcohol. There also just so happens to be an escaped murderer roaming the street who has a bone to pick with babysitters and their friends. It's a very simple story. Small town America is met with an unstoppable force with no reasonable explanation for why they kill. Of course, the typical slasher morality play, but it still feels random and senseless, and I've always enjoyed that aspect of it. There aren't any mysterious powers at play here. Michael Myers is a human, a murderer, and like a lot of actual murderers, there is no rhyme or reason to it. We can discuss nature versus nurture, but at the end of the day, this guy will still kill. The tone of this film is mostly serious and quiet, not over the top. The lighthearted moments come from interactions between characters all over town, and the story is very down to earth and grounded in reality. Let's see how the rest of the franchise does. Halloween 2. Following up the next day, Lori is in the hospital recovering from her injuries, and Loomis is still on the street screaming, he's one shot, ego chow. In this entry, we are also told that Michael is related to Lori, and that's why he's so goal-oriented and has his eyes set on her, tracking her down to the hospital in an attempt to finish what he set out to do so many years ago. Despite my own personal gripes with this entry, most notably being that it really shows that no one wanted to make this film, combined with the instant retconning, taking Michael, an agent of chaos, a symbol of how evil can come to any town, and turning him into a man on a mission to finish his favorite childhood pastime of familicide. Completely removing the randomness of who Michael kills just kind of nerfs him. He's not scary anymore because I'm not related to him, nor am I acquainted with anyone who is. I'm safe. Regardless of these things, this film does flow well with the first one. We learn about the sibling relationship between Lori and Michael at the same time that Lori does. So the retconning is fine, I guess. <laughs> it's still very grounded and real at this point in time. Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. We follow an alcoholic divorced doctor with an interest in women younger than half his age. <sighs> as he attempts to unravel the suspicious death of a patient. Plunging into a world with microchips implanted in brainwashing Halloween masks, men in suits who like to bust a move, an evil leprechaun who stole stones from Stonehenge, fucking robots, and... This has nothing to do with the other two. Or any other Halloween movie coming after it. Spoilers. So yeah, this immediately breaks the immersion. I honestly think it's a fine standalone film if you're into schlock, and that it could have worked if Halloween 2 didn't exist and John Carpenter got to do his anthology film series instead. But as it stands, it's a drastic drop in quality. Rather wacky and over the top as opposed to Halloween's normal small town America setting. It's like X-Files versus CSI. This entry does not flow at all, and is actually detrimental to a Halloween binge in my opinion. Stop it now, turn it off. Damn it! Halloween 4, Return of Michael Myers. So now we're back on track after people were confused about 3, and after killing Michael at the end of 2, he's actually just been in a coma for 10 years. He overhears that he has a niece and decides it's time to wake up. <laughs> Meaning the new bridge between the entries are Michael's necessity to chop down his family tree. Bringing into question why it's almost always Halloween when this happens? Don't think too hard about it. The dude basically just took a long nap and then resumed his life goals and passions. Relatable. This one is still very grounded and much preferring the notion that a slightly more than meets the eye human is going around and murdering every obstacle in his way by sheer will and determination. This one flows well with an ending that sets up a killer Jamie, discussing the cycles of abuse and bringing up the topic of nature versus nurture. Halloween 5, Revenge of Michael Myers. Fuck all that noise, she's now a mute psychic child who has a telepathic connection with Michael. Cool, I wasn't interested in the interesting things anyways. Also, at the end of the last one, Michael got mag dumped on by the local rednecks and fell down a mine. This one opens up saying that Michael took a trip down a river until a too good for his own good homeless man took Michael in and cared for him for a whole year. But it's about to be Halloween, so Michael wakes up and murders him. You can murder all the pot-drinking teens you want, man, but Jesus. Guys, I think Michael might be a bad guy. 
Anyways, this one is much like the previous one, just with the addition of the psychic shit between Jamie and Michael. It ends with a strange man in black blowing up the police station to free Michael. Ooh, I wonder who this could be. As far as flow goes, this one is fine to watch after Return, but as far as story consistency with the first Halloween, this one starts branching off into a more supernatural realm with Michael, at least in this entry, a more direct branch than in previous films. So it's not entirely in keeping with the franchise thus far, but overall, not that bad. Halloween 6, Curse of Michael Myers. So we're talking about consistency, right? Right? Get a load of this shit. So we open up on a cult tying down a girl as she gives birth. Okay. She breaks free and gets away with a baby. We soon find out that this is Jamie. Let me do some mental math real quick. She's 15 at the time, and she is soon killed by Michael. We also find out later in the film that the kid she just gave birth to is Michael's child, who he also wants to kill. He's pretty one trick like that. To be fair, there's an alternate explanation in either the producer or theatrical cut, but really? We're gonna start pulling a Blade Runner with this shit? Not only the stuff with Jamie, but this movie tries to explain why Michael wants to commit familicide. Specifically saying that it's a druid curse that causes someone to kill their family members on Halloween. And there's a cult that worships the person with this curse, and they're trying to clone them, and the curse is going to pass on to another kid, and... I think this one flows worse than Season of the Witch. At least that movie had Halloween on at a bar, so we know those motherfuckers have seen it. So many baffling decisions in the story that, uh, yeah, this is easily the worst of the main run of Halloween films. And I literally can't watch it. H2O. Thankfully, someone had some goddamn sense and killed the whole thorn cult thing immediately. Now the canon is H1 and H2, and then picking up 20 years l Hey, wait a minute. Rip in peace to a real one, by the way. Now, Lori has moved away from Haddonfield and has a new kid. Is this before or after? Never mind. Lori faked her death and changed her name to get away. And Michael is back to being relatively human, just a very persistent one, tracking down Lori at her new life and resuming his familicidal ways. I kind of have a soft spot for this film. Probably because there's so many cool people in it. Full Moon High's Adam Arkin, Michelle Williams, no, smut poet LL yes. Cool J, Joseph Gordon-Levitt as a Jason nod in the intro, Jamie Lee Curtis's mom, Janet Lee, even makes an appearance, and of course, Josh Hartnett. Don't get me wrong, this movie's bad. Like, bad. <laughs> it's just an enjoyable kind of bad for me. And if watched in the intentional order, this entry flows pretty well if you cut at this movie. So you would watch one, two, and then H2O. It actually tells a good story with a pretty satisfying conclusion, and I like it for that. Halloween Resurrection. So Lori killed Michael at the end of H2O. So how does he come back? Lori murdered an innocent man? Lori, what did you- I'll see you in hell. Oh God. How bad is this movie gonna be? Yeah, so immediate retcon on what could have been a poetic and dare I say nice ending to the franchise. <laughs> we gotta keep the money printer printing, baby. Now we have a live streamed reality TV show going into the Myers house for clicks. This shit was ahead of the curve, but Michael doesn't appreciate, well, the whole breaking and entering thing. <laughs> Overall, this is a very meh film. The tone, while not coming close to six, is still over the top and hard to endure, and sometimes feels like a parody. It feels like the focus was less on the horror and more on the eye candy. When it comes to horror, instead of the POV cameras pulling us into the setting, it does the opposite by having the viewer of those cameras be a main character that's not in any danger. We go back and forth, and it breaks the immersion every time. There is but one saving grace for this trash heap of a movie. And his name is Busta fucking Rhymes. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. I don't know why, but this character is just right up my alley and saves this film from being mediocre every time. It also helps that Busta Rhymes is actually a horror fan. So there's that. As far as flow goes, sure, it flows fine. If you ignore the whole body switcheroo and Lori being killed off because Jamie knew better. Back then. I guess you could watch this after H2O, but it feels really pointless. 
It even ends on a cliffhanger, and then that's the last of the original run. Cool. Doesn't really try to say anything like 4. Doesn't close it out like Halloween uh, H2O. It's just, be ready for another one, guys. So we go to the remake, Rob Zombie's Halloween, also known as People Liked Devil's Rejects, right? It's just a little bit too much like Rob's other works for me. Turning the Myers family dysfunctional and redneck and aw shit. Now I'm on Michael's side again. So it's a remake through and through. We see young Michael. A little bit too much, to be honest. As we get to see his life leading up to the night that he murders his sister. Except in this one, he also murders his sister's boyfriend and his mom's boyfriend. They're not the same person. The confusion is understandable as this is a Rob Zombie movie. We even get to see more of Michael in the sanitarium where he kills Danny Trejo. What did he do to you? Can't let those walls get you down. All right, he's a bad guy again. The rest is your typical slasher movie, just with that special Rob Zombie touch. No, not shots of his wife's ass, even though those are here. I'm talking about the over-the-top gore and violence for the sake of over-the-top gore and violence. I have a soft spot for that. There's just so many wild-ass decisions with this film that makes it hard to watch. But the actual hard part is that there's so much that's cool. Tyler Mayne as Spikel is awesome when he's mute. Seeing so many cool actors, the cool kills, the kid from Hancock beating up the kid from Spy Kids. And then the Rob Zombie flare comes in and you just... Mom. <gasps> Man, why the fuck am I watching this again? When it comes to consistency, the tone is all over the place. It definitely feels like Rob Zombie's Halloween, and it doesn't flow well with the rest of the series because of that. But I don't think it's really meant to. So yeah, this one is an extremely mixed bag for me. Guilty pleasure, maybe? Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. You couldn't pay me to talk about this film. I'm serious. We're moving along. So, we're at the second remake now. Also named just Halloween. Cool, guys. Real cool. So this is just a remake, right? It's not. It's a sequel. To which one? The first one? So it's Halloween 2. 2. Anyways. Yeah, this one picks up 40 years after the events of John Carpenter's Halloween and completely disregards Annie and everything that ever happened between then and now. Lori is now an alcoholic recluse who, relatably, hates true crime podcasts. She's been haunted by Michael for four decades and has ruined her relationship with her daughter because of it. Just when she's about to get over it, Michael gets some help from a small friend in a high place and resumes his save file from 40 years ago. I only ever really liked the first one, so I'm not complaining about the decision to completely dismiss the rest of the series. As far as films, this one isn't so bad. It's now back to being completely grounded in reality and is in keeping with the tone of the very first entry. So it flows very well with that. Just ignore the fact that Michael is geriatric pulling some of these stunts. It's more immersion breaking than seeing Robert De Niro in The Irishman. I also wish it wasn't filled with a nostalgia bait, constantly recreating moments or kills from the Halloweens that they specifically took out of this canon. It feels like they couldn't just make their own movie and had to keep putting things in there for fans to be like, oh, hey, dude, it's the thing, sweet. And I really did not enjoy that. All in all, it's a nice ending. Three generations of Strodes coming together to put to bed a being that has haunted them for so long. I like that it's just a tack on to the first Halloween, completely ignoring the familicide element that was added in two, making this a simple duology that closes things out nicely. There's two more. Halloween kills. Don't even get me started with this shit. This is literally an intermission between the first of the new trilogy and the ending. You cannot convince me or any other non-receiver of the free lobotomy behind the 7-Eleven that it's not just a filler piece cash grab. Everyone always says that you should start positive and end positive, but the problem here is that there's only one fucking positive. Some of the kills are funny. That's it. That's the only good thing I can say about this film. Everyone in Haddonfield decides to form a mob to beat up an old ass escaped middle patient? What the fuck are the words that I just said? We're gonna go after him, we're gonna find my- What? Is this movie trying to say something about mob justice? Cause we already have Silver Bullet for that. I'm gonna go out and hunt up a little private justice. What the actual fuck is supposed to be going on here? Not to mention, you have a whole ass mob and you still can't kill him? 
There's two big no-nos here. The first is that you didn't double tap. The second is that you had a whole ass mob and yet you still attacked one at a time like you're working for a Power Rangers villain. You're a mob. Kick his geezer ass and get it over with. <laughs> the movie just infuriates me, if you can't tell. Lori is holed up in a hospital the entire film and Jamie probably got her filming done in one week because of it. The story is cyclical in nature and actually goes nowhere. There's only one thing that changes from the end of the first entry to the beginning of the third. Karen dies. You wanna fucking kill someone? Take me! Oh, I guess I can end on something positive. Halloween ends. I sure hope it does. Getting too old for this shit, Michael sees promise in an awkward young male and begins a mentorship program teaching him the way of the blade. No homo. <laughs> sure, whatever. I just have one little question. Who the fuck is this? Yeah, let's make a trilogy. We set out to make a trilogy from the very beginning. Of course, obviously. That's why we bring up all this shit, not the first one. Certainly not in the second one. But we save it for the third. This is like a bad TV show that doesn't know which direction is up and they're all fumbling trying to figure out where they want to take it and what ends up happening. This ends up happening. How hard would it have been to have shown the kid throughout the first and second entry? These writers are hacks. All of them are hacks. Hacks. Another thing, Michael fucking bodied an entire mob at the end of the last one, doing karate in the pit. Now he's too frail to take on one skinny little kid? Why? Has he been huffing sewer fumes too long? The consistency between just even the previous installation and this one is completely out of the window. Now Michael is weak and this kid is basically doing all the work for him. And honestly, a passing of the torch kind of storyline could have worked if it were properly incorporated and fit with the rest of the new trilogy. But it doesn't, because again, these guys are hacks. At least one thing's for sure. They gave Michael the life leak inspired training video treatment and chucked his ass on a scrap shredder. Surely, he won't be coming back anytime soon. We gotta keep the money for your frenzy, baby. Watching this franchise from front to back would really only be something that a clinically insane person would do. The amount of retcons, 180s, redirections, inconsistencies. Honestly, if they had just made the series an anthology series, scrapped Halloween 2, made Season of the Witch the second one, and continued the anthology series, I think the series would have been better off. I have always maintained that the first Halloween is, and always will be, the best one in the series. Hell, put a gun to my head and I'll probably have to contend that the first Halloween is the best of the big slasher series. But following that up with the rest of the franchise just tarnishes what good it brings to the table. When I watch Halloween, I really only watch Halloween 1. But I also enjoy the 1-2 H2O combination. Not because it's good, I just like seeing Josh Hart in it. I even think John Carpenter's Halloween followed by Green's Halloween could work if you cut out the credits and that one pesky little cheeky ass shot they put in there. So I'm going to use a graphic to help out here with a recap. And it's basically scores during a binge. Green means I'll sit down to watch it. Yellow is I'll have it on in the background. Orange is I'll check on it every now and then maybe. And red is, I'll change the channel. Easy to understand? Here's a few examples with other series first. The fire! You stupid bitch! <laughs> Fuck you, Lucky Charms. Formula! Everybody's a suspect! Now, what does Halloween look like? Yeah. Not that favorable when you look at it that way. Now it's time to make my case for Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th, a franchise built on the many carcasses of horny, druggy, naughty campers. Campers. Summer campers. Uh, okay, hear me out. I know it's summer camp. I'm not fully delusional, but I am really going to have to convince you that there's fall vibes in this series. See, 
while it can't fully touch Halloween, is definitely not the worst out there. Now onto the consistency. So, like with Halloween, we will let the first film set the precedent. In Friday the 13th, we follow a group of young adults as they open up Camp Crystal Lake in preparation for the arrival of the kids. But there's someone out there who just doesn't really understand the whole summer camp craze. So, they're a murderin'. We later find out that the killer is one Mrs. Voorhees, whose son drowned while under the supervision of neglectful counselors. I'm assuming that her son's death would have been ruled an accident, so she sees it as her duty to make sure the camp never gets reopened, and that anyone who tries to will encounter the same tragic fate that her son did. This film is famous for its ending. As Alice lays collapsed in a boat out in the middle of Crystal Lake, a young Jason emerges from the waters and attacks her. When she wakes up from her supposed dream and mutters, and he's still there. Leaving the movie open for a sequel. And boy was it ever. The story is very straightforward. Group of young adults getting got by a hidden killer. As far as tone goes, it's very grounded until we get to the ending where there's some uncertainty as to what Alice saw. Did a young Jason actually attack her on the boat? Did he survive the drowning? Or was he resurrected somehow? Just a hint of a mystery going on. With the main focus being the mortality of teenagers. So, Friday the 13th Part 2, we open up with a bunch, and I mean a bunch, of recapping from the previous film, and see Alice trying to live her best life, but girl, you know we can't just let that happen. Jason show her what's good before hiking his ass back home to Crystal Lake. Some years later, apparently long enough for people to forget about the slayings, there are some new counselors attempting to open up a summer camp, within walking distance of Camp Crystal Lake. At a campfire, the leader of this group decides to spread the tale of Jason Voorhees, letting us in on his apparent survival and witnessing of his mother's death. From here on out, pretty much the same old, same old happens. Jason takes them out one by one. They try to fight back. They think he's dead, only for the ending to be ambiguous. The fact that this one was so strapped for time that it opens with like five minutes of exposition actually kind of helps. Because if given the opportunity, we can skip the first one and go straight into Jason killing without missing much. It also helps that we don't see Mrs. Voorhees until the end of the first film. As the tone of the film is still a hidden killer, taking out camp counselors one by one. So even though we switch from Mama Voorhees to Mama's boy Jason as the killer, the overall tone and story are the same. Annoying people getting murdered in the woods, sometimes next to a lake. Friday the 13th, part three. This one follows up immediately after the events of part two. So of course it will flow well. The only big difference is the reliance on 3D technologies because it's the eighties and the title has a three in it, duh. So there's these painfully obvious shots of people practically poking the camera lens with objects. It's now more comedic than anything and adds to the charm of the film in my personal opinion. In the film, we now follow a completely unrelated group of characters as they venture to one of their homes on Crystal Lake. To Bedlam. They are later joined by a group of scorned bikers looking to cause mischief, it seems, who serve mostly as body count enhancers. In this film, we get one of the more divisive characters. I've always liked Shelly, so I was kind of surprised to hear that people don't like him. I don't know, maybe I sympathized with him when I was a younger or something? I don't know. Get fucked. Shelly's awesome. It's by this point that we should realize that the Friday the 13th movies are very formulaic. Group of young adults plus Jason equals death. It's very simple, and there's not really much more to it. Jason serves as a link between each film, and the variance comes from the difference in cast of characters. This is an amazing template, and I believe this is the film where it really hammers home that that's what the series will be. It's also the entry where Jason gets his infamous hockey mask from Shelley, of all characters. Not only do we solidify what Friday the 13th is meant to be, but we also meet the iconic image of Jason. I find that poetic. Friday the 13th, part four, the final chapter. Keeping in line with part three, this one also takes place immediately after the film that came before it. So that's three in a row now that are essentially taking place during the same week. So Jason died in the previous one and he's taken to a morgue until the eternal desire to keep those damn kids off his lawn kicks in and yeah. Meanwhile, back at the lake, a group of teenagers are on their way for the weekend, apparently missing every single newspaper on the way into town that details the several grisly murders that have been happening just days prior. Whatever. There, the body count rises as we meet a hitchhiker, twins, and are introduced to the Jarvises, including Tom Savini's self-insert Tommy, who brings the young kid perspective and honestly is one of the best parts of the film. His childlike wonder at trying to just see some titties is always hilarious and charming in a way. It reminds me of simpler times, I guess. But there is another character that steals the show, and that's Crispin Glover as Dead Fuck Jimmy. A dead Fuck? Who, even if he didn't become a big name actor, would have cemented himself in history with this hey, one role. Hey, Ted, where the hell's Parks Grove? This entry also has more psychology play with Jason, 
where during the finale, Tommy cuts his hair off in an effort to look like Jason, distracting him long enough for him and his sister to get the upper hand, where one of the more iconic scenes of the franchise plays out. Given that this film is another continuation, making part two, three, and four all connected, it flows pretty well. The only thing is the more final nature of his death in the previous film. But Jason has always been mysterious, and it's never been confirmed that he either actually survived the drowning or that he wasn't a supernatural entity. So him taking a trip to the morgue and then why whying on the ground until the time's right isn't super far-fetched and doesn't drastically change the tone or story direction. Part five, a new beginning. So they killed Jason in the previous entry. How do they keep the whole group of young adults plus Jason equals death formula chugging along? Well, now there's a copycat killer. Yeah, this is the one that doesn't count. This film tries to tie itself to the other films by showing us a character and saying he's the grown-up version of Tommy Jarvis from part four. So I feel like this is an important thing to discuss. Personally, I feel like every Friday the 13th uses new characters and it's one of the great strengths of the, of the series, making it so each entry is fresh and new with none of that pesky baggage. They may have tried to have their little Laurie Strode here with Tommy Boy, but the fact that they use different actors for each iteration really just separates the character even further than the writing did. So part five's version of Tommy Jarvis is having trouble adjusting after the events of four. So he's being transferred to live at a commune of sorts for troubled adolescence. Murder happens, because of course, and then more murder happens, because of course. It seems like Jason is back for blood. Tommy, yet again, has to step up and kill Spoilers, I guess, but the killer is actually the paramedic, which, to be fair, the reason he goes on a murdering spree is his son died. So the whole familial revenge thing is maybe a link between films if you really want to make that stretch. But for myself, I mostly just skip this one as it absolutely does not flow well with the rest of the franchise, which sucks because there's tons of great additions for this one. Demon played by Miguel A. Nunez Jr., those damn enchiladas, Reggie is an interesting character, and who could forget the robot dance? I know I couldn't. Part six, Jason lives. Yet again, we follow Tommy Jarvis, and just like part five, it's a different actor, a different writer, and what feels like a completely different character. After recent hallucinations, he needs to make sure that motherfucker is dead. So we do a little grave robbing and a bit of desecration of remains. Except, oops, you played yourself, Tommy. You played yourself all over that graveyard. He stabs him with a metal rod in the middle of a fucking thunderstorm. And oh, shit. I'm going to assume you've seen Frankenstein. Jason's back, and after finding out they renamed his home to something stupid like Forest Green, and that people are still on his goddamn lawn, he's left for, I mean, back for blood. This entry has a lot more fodder. Not only are there campers, but there's the sheriff's station, as well as an employee bonding exercise paintball game going on in Jason's backyard. Part six is high up there for me. It turns into more of a mystical slasher with Jason getting his revenant form, and it also brings a lot more lighthearted comedy moments. So, what were you gonna be when you grew up? Darling, you're gonna be the death of me. I love the paintball scene so much in this film. This is always a guaranteed watch for me. Despite going headfirst into the Frankenstein Jason Alley, it still flows really well with the rest of the franchise, in my opinion. Friday the 13th, The New Blood. A few months after Tommy pulls a good fellows on Jason, a young girl whose name is absolutely not Carrie has a psychic episode and force slams the dock into Crystal Lake, killing her alcoholic father. Seven years later, she returns with her mother and the world's worst therapist in order to help her process what happened. Thankfully, for the body count, there just so happens to be a large group of teens next door spending a friend's birthday at Crystal Lake. Not Carrie has another episode, and while vulnerable, she returns to the dock and attempts to bring her dad back. Sure, what's the worst that could happen? Oh, that. So that's how they bring Jason back, through a telepathic teenager respawning him. Could have been worse. Your typical Friday the 13th experience ensues, but this time Jason has a worthy opponent. Not Carrie uses her psychic powers to attack Jason, and honestly, they're pretty evenly matched. But Jason is, well, Jason. <laughs> Not Carrie resurrects her dead dad, but only momentarily, so he can use his abusive dad powers to defeat Jason for redemption, sinking his ass back to the bottom of Crystal Lake. 
I really hope no one drinks this water. So this one goes a bit off the deep end with the supernatural stuff, and I'm only mentioning this because I don't want to sound like a hypocrite. When Halloween introduced the Thorn Cult, it changed way too much of what we had previously understood about the world it takes place in that had been established by multiple entries. But with Friday the 13th, they kind of slowly introduced these elements, while also being of a dubious background from the get-go. So when we randomly have not Carrie going Kadabra on Jason, it isn't so outside the realm of possibilities. I do, however, like that we don't really go down this route again, though. Friday the 13th being so one note with the formula of group of young adults plus Jason equals death leaves it open for a lot of experimentation. And this entry definitely takes advantage of it while still delivering and staying consistent with what's come to be expected from a Friday the 13th film. Friday the 13th part eight, Jason takes Manhattan. Jason takes a boat. So a boat is going through Crystal Lake when, after the teens on board conveniently rehash the tale of Jason Voorhees, the boat anchor hits some cables and that's what it feels like to chew five gum. Jason hitches a ride and thanks them for the res in his own special way. Now this is called Jason Takes Manhattan, but really that's only the last quarter of the film. The majority of it takes place on a boat. Well, a ship, but it's more fun to say a boat. I will say, the characters in this one leave a lot to be desired. For some reason, they decided to take a dog on the boat, so that's my favorite character, fuck it. The boat setting actually adds some interesting sets and a sense of claustrophobia. There's isolation, like being trapped in the woods with Jason, and then there's trapped on a boat in a giant body of water. I know which one is scarier, despite how much I love the forest settings. Fast forward through your normal slasher film a bit, the last remaining survivors hop aboard a life raft and make their way to New York as Jason, I'm assuming also in a life raft, follows in pursuit. Jason arrives in New York, and the body count is happy about that. We get some really fun Jason scenes. <laughs> including one where Kane Hodder confronts Freddy vs. Jason Jason, Ken Kurzinger. Ever since the inception of the series, Jason has been killing people close to Crystal Lake. I guess this one sort of works around that in that he takes a trip on a ship that sailed through Crystal Lake. It sort of works. When he gets to Manhattan, he's mainly hunting down the people who were on his lawn, or lake, I guess. But regardless, the scenes of Jason in Manhattan are very fun. Part 9. Jason Goes to Hell. So if Part 5 is the one that doesn't count, what does that make this one? So after the events of Jason Takes a Boat, he's back to life with no reason given and found his way back home. I kind of like this intro for the whole fake out and then the military equivalent of a mag dump overkill on poor Jason, but they really do gloss over how he came back and got back to Crystal Lake. His body, or the objects formerly known as his body, are FedEx to a morgue where someone mistakes his heart for a sandwich, allowing Jason to now possess people. Not only that, but this film wants to introduce that only members of Jason's family can kill his ass for good. But that if Jason's soul possesses a family member instead, he would be back to his immortal ways. Why? Why did you have to do this? This one is conflicting for a few reasons. I really enjoy seeing Stephen Williams in this. I don't think so. Who I know mostly as Rufus from Supernatural. He's always a great character to see on screen. I also... That's... That's it. Jason Goes to Hell is essentially the Halloween 6 and dream child of the Friday the 13th series. It jumps the shark-infested waters of Crystal Lake on a bedazzled jet ski. This one flows about as well as oatmeal. At the end of the film, however, we get a teaser. A shot of Jason's iconic hockey mask on the ground as Freddy's glove emerges, hinting at the arrival of the long-awaited clash between the two giants. So let's talk about that move. Hey, wait. That's not Freddy vs. Jason. So for some unknown reason, they decided to put Jason several centuries in the future in space. Yeah, because that worked out so damn well for Leprechaun and Hellraiser, didn't it, fellas? Basically, Jason gets captured by the military that wants to do experiments in the hopes of taking advantage of his regenerative, uh, regenerative abilities. That goes about as well as anyone would think it would, and they end up cryogenically freezing him, which was all the rage in the early 2000s. So about 450 years later... Well, a group of young adults, and it's the future, so of course a sex bot, are on a field trip of sorts. They visit the Crystal Lake Research Facility and discover Jason's frozen body. And just like the red-blooded Americans they were, their first instinct is to take it for themselves for whatever purposes they may have. <gasps> Commence the carnage. After some top-notch kills- Guys! It's okay, he just wanted his machete back! The ship's surviving members make an attempt at putting him to a stop, but for some reason they knock his body into a space-age medical machine that basically gives him a juggernaut suit, remaking him as the cyborg Uber Jason. Commence the carnage. Again. You guys might want to run. What the hell is going on? Jason fucking Borges, that's what's going on. Beautiful. 
with a shot of his mask sinking into a lake, setting up a potential sequel. Yeah, this movie's horrible. I will always maintain that good kills in a slasher is no excuse for brain-dead writers. This one does not flow well. If Jason Goes to Hell was straight out of left field, this one's chilling in the goddamn parking lot. Freddy vs. Jason. Now we can finally talk about Freddy vs. Jason. After having this hyped up for so long, it finally became a reality. Merging two iconic giants in the horror world and then making them duke it out. The setup. Freddy is stuck in hell and devises a plan to come back. If someone starts killing the teens in Springwood again, then Freddy's name will start circulating, allowing him to regain his power through word of mouth. Using emotional manipulation, Freddy resurrects and enlists the help of Jason, turning his aggression from the kids on his lawn at Crystal Lake to the kids in Springwood. Now that things are set in motion, Freddy very quickly realizes that Jason will be getting in his way once his full power returns, eventually tranquilizing him and then the Springwood teens traffic his body back to Crystal Lake as part of their plan to have Jason take out Freddy. After a long fight with several stray casualties, Freddy is decapitated and Jason sinks to the bottom of Crystal Lake. The final shot of the film shows Jason emerging from Crystal Lake with Freddy's head in his hand as Freddy looks at the camera and winks. This one had the arduous task of maintaining consistency with two separate franchises, and personally, I think it succeeds at that. Freddy here is a lot more like Nightmare on Elm Street 1 Freddy, with the occasional one-lighter and bitch thrown in. <laughs> Jason is back to being an unstoppable force with mama issues who just wants those damned kids off his lawn. Despite how dated the trends of early 2000s horror films are, this one still holds up in its own regard. Friday the 13th Remake we open up on a group of friends around a campfire, once again keeping the tale of Jason Voorhees alive and well, while on their excursion for hidden pot crops in the woods. Jason says no to pot poachers and lays the smack down on them, opening the remake up with rapid, brutal kills, setting the tone immediately. Borrowing a line from part three, we have a Rod character who is looking for his sister, one of the pot hunters in the intro, who was potentially killed by Jason. He runs into another group of people going to their rich douchebag friend's vacation lake house, and Jason gets a chub at the rising number of expendable characters. From here on out, it's your standard Friday the 13th movie. Annoying characters, getting hack and slashed, some eye candy, some prime Jason shots, and of course, great effects and kills. We have another callback, this time to part two, with a character pretending to be Jason's mom to fuck with him. Kinda rude to be honest. Of all the remakes, of all the slashers, of all the bars, and all the galaxies, this is the one that understood the assignment. So much so that this incarnation of Jason is one of my favorites. It's urban assault, commando survivalist Jason who runs. What more could you want? Yeah, okay, the, the characters are way more grating than usual. And there certainly are flaws with the plot here and there. But by this point, anyone going into a Friday the 13th movie is going for one thing. To see Jason Voorhees go apeshit on some naughty college kids in the woods. You're not coming to Friday the 13th for filet mignon from a three-star restaurant. You're coming here for flank steak tacos from a taco truck. And that's exactly what you're going to get. And that's what cements this franchise as the best for me. It very quickly established what a Friday the 13th movie was and what to expect. And it kept, more or less, true to that in every installment. Now that we've finished going over each of the Friday the 13th films, let's see what the results for this one look like on the graphic. Now, let's compare this with Halloween's results. Hopefully I've made my point, and if not, Hopefully you've enjoyed my lunatic ranting and raving about these films that mean so much to me. So this Halloween, go watch Friday the 13th instead. Later.